Good morning. I'm very excited to be here today. Before I get started, I want to get a clarification on something. Being that we're here in the middle of Pennsylvania, is it y'all, yins, or you all here? <laughs> yins? Who, who, who's for yins? <laughs> how, 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 I was going to start by saying how yins doing this morning. But I would, no, see, there's how are you all doing this morning. So I'd like to kick off talking a little bit today about what it's like to try and make change in an organization when it may be a really difficult thing to do. I've talked to a lot of folks who may work for themselves or start their own companies, and they talk about making change for the web in a way that seems very common sense, but they may not have the constraints that those within a larger organization have. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my process and growth in discovering that, and how I learned to make change in a larger organization when I was in the position of only being a designer. So we're gonna start this off with an embarrassing childhood photo of mine. I want to take you back to 1991. I was, oh, about 10 years old. I loved pop culture. Slap bracelets, puffy paint, bright green shoelaces. And to give you some context, this is actually what a mobile device looked like back in 1991. So if you take a look at your iPhone today and think back to this large, Phone, which they actually called a brick because it was eight pounds and would only be put inside of a car. So that was mobile then. Smells Like Teen Spirit was on the radio in the number one place. One of my favorite albums of all time, Nirvana. But what was more important this year was the year that the greatest movie of all time hit theaters. <laughs> That's right, Point Break. So if you're not familiar with Point Break, it's a movie about surfers who go on a, a uh, I would say, a bank robbing binge in Southern California. And an FBI agent, Ke played by Keanu Reeves, is trying to infiltrate their group and catch them. But it wasn't Patrick Swayze's character, Bodie, or Keanu Reeves' character that really interested me as a 10-year-old girl it was this one, it was Tyler Endicott. She was this badass surfer chick who had great taste in clothes, surfed as great as all the other dudes, and even taught Keanu Reeves how to surf. And as you can see here, she had this very distinct pixie haircut. And I, as a 10-year-old girl who wanted to be completely on the cutting edge of pop culture, thought to myself, well, I'm going to make a really big change. I want a haircut just like Tyler Endicott. I saw this as being like the new kind of fashion forward thing, like very trendy. I was always ahead of trends. I wanted to be the cool person in school because I'm 10 years old. I'm about to start at a middle school. So I begged my mom. I said, mom, please take me to get this haircut. And she, being someone who's very supportive of all my crazy adventures, took me and we got my haircut. It was this great little pixie do and I was super stoked on it. I looked a lot like Tyler, actually, except for one thing. She was a 28-year-old woman, and I was a 10-year-old girl. And as we were leaving the salon, my mom takes me to McDonald's, and at that time, McDonald's gave Barbie Happy Meals to girls and Hot Wheels Happy Meals to boys. And as I pulled up to the counter and they handed me my Hot Wheels Happy Meal, it occurred to me that I didn't think of the context to this change. I didn't think about what I had just done because I had just basically committed social suicide. <laughs> While I was really into trends and exciting things that were going on in pop culture, I was incredibly introverted and really shy. And I was about to start middle school with all new people with a, this pixie haircut that made me look just like a little boy. And so, 
thinking back on this, you know, there's all of these things that were going through my mind about wanting to chase this trend and do something different and new and exciting, but I didn't think about the context of the change that I made. So I did what I, the only thing I could do. This is actually the first day of school at the middle school, and I'm here with my sister. You can't change a haircut, right? So I'm starting to think of all the ways that I can begin to, to fix this change that I made. So I began to put on lipstick and earrings and uh, wear a skirt. And if you'll notice here, what middle school kid wears a purse <laughs> with a backpack to school? I'm trying my hardest, right, to make sure everybody knows. This was a huge mistake that I made, and I paid for it. We, we develop these habits based on the context of our own personal experiences. To many people, my fear of going to a salon now and getting a drastic haircut may make very little sense. It's not logical to most folks, but I carry that experience with me over time. So I want to take you to back again, but only about five years ago, into my professional career. I was working in an agency where we worked with a lot of large institutions, healthcare, government, education, and we began using style guides as a way to not only help our clients have the tools they needed to work beyond our engagements, but in order for them to be able to understand all of the different components of their front-end design. So if you've been looking online lately, you may see that these style guides, these living front-end style guides are pretty popular now. A lot of people are talking about them. And we had been doing this for a while. It worked wonderfully. Our clients were really happy with this. And we were also using style tiles, which was just mentioned a moment before. This began to pick up. I found that this was something that really worked for me and my clients and my team we were super stoked with this. It was perfect in the context of the projects we were working on. So I began to share it, and it was picked up by an Alist apart. Talked a little bit about how I was using style tiles to begin a conversation with my clients, and then using style guides to give them the tools they needed to work beyond that. And then that turned into speaking and talking with other folks about this methodology, this idea of designing systems and not pages. And, and it became pretty popular. So, as many things do on the internet, it caught on and it brought me a very interesting new opportunity. I was approached by a tech company about three years ago that told me they had a lot of the similar problems that my clients had. They had all of these different websites that were running on different CMSs, had different content, looked very different, and they wanted to implement the systems that I had been talking about publicly within their own organization. So, something I learned actually in working at a tech company is that everything has a code name. And I actually really disliked the code name of my project, so I renamed it for this. We're gonna call it Mission Condor for the sake of this project. So Mission Contour, to give you an idea of what it was that I was facing, was, was to unite over 35 websites and pages on one CMS to rule them all. So this may start to sound familiar because this isn't a problem that just maybe a tech company may have. It's a problem that a government agency may have, an educational institution may have. They had multiple vertical sub-brands, you know? They had a different, if you think of Nike, for example, there's Nike swimming and running, and they all look Nike, but we needed to implement this idea that there would be different vertical sub-brands within them. There needed to be a content strategy for over 30 blogs. It needed to be available in 20 languages. And then it also had to be localized for multiple markets. So if you think about not only the translations, but the context of what we were talking about needed to be appropriate depending on what country we're talking about it. And so they had no style guide at this time, no CMS, no content strategy. Matter of fact, their websites, if you were to plot them out in what you'd call like a, a site map, it would look like this. Every single one was completely different. And not only from a content creator standpoint, but from a user standpoint. They may stumble upon one site when searching something through Google, but then be at a dead end. They couldn't find their way around. We were hoping 
to bring everything into alignment a little bit more like this, creating more of an umbrella site with a content management system that created verticals. So I came in and started and kicked the project off with style tiles. And it was really fantastic reception. People were really stoked about it. I got them together in a room, I put out the style tiles, and everybody's like, yes, this is what we needed. The energy was great, people were on board. I then introduced the idea of atomic design, which Brad Frost, who will be talking to you guys tomorrow, invented. This idea of breaking components down into smaller pieces, beginning to make them more into a style guide for you to use over a long period of time. And so we did this with not only like our colors, but we also did it with buttons and navigation systems. And people, again, they were incredibly stoked with this. The reception was almost strangely positive. I, I would continue to present these things, and people would just be like, good job. We're really, we really feel excited about what we've committed to in doing this. Again, we then worked to create specifications. We made templating systems so that not only did people have the components they needed and the styles were set, they could then create their own websites, somewhat like Squarespace. They could assemble all these components into different layouts that we created, and we spec'd out everything down to the actual CSS they'd be using. And again, people were really excited. We knew that we needed to give folks the tools. And we knew that just like when I was working at an agency, you had to bring everyone along for the ride so that they would be bought in and emotionally excited about the process so that they would use them. So the day came when we completed the entire project. We were ready to hand over the keys so that all of these different people around the world could take our components and styles and assemble them themselves and create responsive websites on behalf of our organization. We handed over the keys and something very interesting happened. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing happened. Matter of fact, I would begin to check in on folks and ask them, How, how's it going using the style guide? I started to dig into what they were doing, and I would find they were still opening up new Photoshop documents and creating fixed width layouts in Photoshop and completely ignoring the styles. And I would ask them, well, what about the style guide we have? And they were like, that's great, but it's faster for me to do it this way. Or I would reach out to an organization in another country and say, hey, I saw you just hired an agency for this. Do you realize that we've created all the tools that you can use in order to do this efficiently and actually save money on behalf of the company? They say, yeah, well, that's just not really that interesting to us. We'd like to continue working with an agency. So as I am a designer and I analyze things, I decided maybe we just didn't do it right the first time. So we did it all over again. This was over the course of two years, so we're at about the one year mark. We literally spent the next six to eight months doing the entire process over again, getting buy-in from the style tiles all the way back to the templates. And this time, when we implemented it, began to check in on people, the mood changed. There wasn't, there wasn't that happy excitedness. It was kind of like, okay, we get it. You guys want to do this thing, but it's not really working. And at first, it was kind of this cordial anger, and then it turned into like downright knock, knock down, drag out, like fighting. Like people were aggressively saying, no, we don't want to do this. And at that point, I declared it a bit of a fail. My team and I were a little baffled. We were a little concerned, actually. Why did we fail this mission? It had worked so many times before. When I had been working with my team and an agency, and we'd been working with all of these institutions that, that had very similar scenarios, began to dissect what had happened. We didn't adapt the tools to the culture that was within the organization. We didn't really assess how people were working and what they needed and what skill sets were available within the, amongst the folks who were using it. You know, it's really easy to create a style guide that's all in front-end code, but if every single person doesn't understand CSS, that may begin to, to make them feel as though they need to learn a new skill set and then they can't work as fast. 
I also used methods that had worked for me before, but they didn't translate to this landscape. They were too slow, and they invited a lot of bureaucracy. Every time I brought in people to approve something, it took more time rather than just getting the results. And in an environment where results are valued, this actually gummed up the situation. The last reason we decided that causes failure was that we were actually speaking the wrong language of the executives. When you're working in an agency environment, for example, it's all about efficiency and making money based on time. So before, if I could do something faster, that was actually increasing the amount of money we were making. But in this situation, it was all about the results. It didn't matter how fast I did any of the work I was doing, it was the results that matter. And that caused a lot of problems when it actually came to buy-in within the top levels of the organization. It became very clear that this project was started in a way that did not necessarily address the design problem from the top down. We didn't think about the entire landscape. We were just trying to implement something that had been told to us. And this is basically comes down to the idea of organizational problems versus design problems. Like, a lot of times it's hard as a designer to think about getting things changed because you're like, oh, if the organization would just change, the way the approval process just changed, it, it would make my job easier. But the fact of the matter is, is organizational problems are design problems. And it's about reframing what design is and how we work as designers to influence those problems above us. And this can, this can seem like a pretty big, this can seem like a pretty big job, but there's ways to do it. Both of these stories I just told you, they're about failing and then trying to overcome a change afterwards. And as UX professionals, it's our jobs to empathize with our users. But I'm asking you for this situation here today to empathize with those who are around you who are resistant to change. We're oftentimes really just focused on like making our websites, doing our job, but there's a moment where we have to step back and wonder why is it that folks around us aren't changing? Put ourselves in their position. You may not be able to necessarily relate with them on the specific change they're resisting, but perhaps you've maybe had a bad haircut and then been really resistant to wanting to get another. Or you've been through a project that may have affected you in a way that has influenced the way you make decisions and push change. Putting yourselves in their position. So let's talk a little bit today about why people don't change. What are the consequences of not changing? So first reason why people don't change. I want to tell you a little story that actually happened to me last night. I was at the reception here for the conference, and I sat down with a lovely group of folks, and two gentlemen, Tom and Jason, uh, asked me if I wanted to play a game called Bean Boozled. And I asked them, what in the world is this? And I think the most eloquent explanation of what this game is is that it's uh, like Russian roulette, but with jelly beans. So you spin this little dial, right? And you land on a color of a jelly bean, and there's a chance you're going to draw out of this little, uh, this little box of jelly beans either a delicious jelly bean or a horrible jelly bean. So if you can see here, like, for example, green is juicy pear or booger. I was lucky enough to get the black jelly bean, which you can see is licorice or skunk spray. And I went ahead and ate the skunk spray. <laughs> and it will now forever terrify me to eat another black jelly bean. <laughs> this is not something, this isn't like a scenario that we all experience, right? This is a scenario that I experienced last night and I happened to have gotten the black jelly bean. If I would have gotten licorice, I might have been fine. But this causes fear, right? Change is often resisted because we all have these fears that we've developed because of these different scenarios. Man, I hate it when this pops up on my computer. 
There's nothing that I dislike more than seeing this window on my computer. I hate having to think about my tools. I just want them to be invisible to me. So when recently a friend of mine, who actually makes one of these tools, asked me why I had not upgraded my version of Photoshop in years, I began to think a little bit about it. I was, I was thinking about why, why, why wouldn't I be able to, why, why can't I personally do this? Like I know that the Adobe Creative Suite that's now out there has better tools. I was telling him, you know, it would be great if it had, you know, fonts that I could use from Typekit, and he's like, yeah, it's got that. And I was like, oh, what if I could use components from libraries? He's like, it's got that. So I got to the point where I was like, I've got to really <laughs> upgrade my software, right? I had run out of excuses with myself. And it was kind of embarrassing, too, because I'm here talking about change, right? And they're like, you can't even upgrade your own software. And so I began to really assess what was going on there. And I realized it was because I kind of knew that this was going to take me a very long time. This was going to be something where I had to stop what I did in my normal day-to-day -day routine and begin to think, begin to just take a time out and do something. So 14 hours, that's billable time for me, right? That's 14 hours that I'm not making money. But an investment up front like this can make me money in the long run because it's actually creating efficiencies and giving me better tools. So time, time's a reason why people are resistant to change. It may not surprise you, based on the previous story that I don't like to upgrade my software, that I also really dislike keyboard shortcuts. Yeah, I know, it sounds like, as being a designer, like other designers watch me and they think it's crazy, but there's something very zen-like for me to be able to go up to the file menu, think through all of the options, scroll down the menu, choose my next tool, and then move on to my next action. It helps me collect my thoughts and ideas between every single action I do. This is absolutely crazy to people who use keyboard shortcuts constantly for efficiency. But you see, it works for me. It's something that feels really comfortable. It allows me to collect my thoughts and keep myself organized in a way that makes sense. And for some folks, you can interpret this organizationally as maybe something similar to bureaucracy, right? Like there's these things that happen that because people are just comfortable with them. And they don't make sense for efficiency's sake. They don't make sense logically, but they do them and they work for them because they're comfortable for their organization. And Bureaucracy is probably the hardest point of the three that I've just gone through for many people to, to come to terms with, but I found that if I can become zen-like with the idea of bureaucracy being something that I need to overcome and change and work with, then design change can happen. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when you don't change. What are the consequences if an organization ends up not changing, just continuing to do things the way they always have? This is Steven Sasson. He invented the digital camera in 1975. It was completely an accident. He had been commissioned to do a project. He was right out of college where he needed to figure out solid state imaging for a camera. They had decided to move away from celluloid film and they wanted him to figure out a way to do that. He wasn't actually tasked with the idea of using the lens or any of that stuff but he found that he wasn't able to test his solid state processor without creating the full camera. This thing weighed eight pounds. It took a picture that only was 0.01 megapixels. And it literally saved the photos to a cassette. <laughs> it was a far cry from the phones we use today to take photos. And you'd wonder yourself, what company do you think he worked for? Did he work for Nikon or Canon or one of the other digital giants that own the digital camera market today? But no, he actually worked for Kodak. Steve Sasson created one of the most 
disruptive technologies of our time, and he worked at Kodak, which in January 2012 filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Uh, <laughs> and they no longer make any digital cameras or digital products. So it's interesting, in this situation, they had to change there. They knew that what they needed, they knew what they needed to do to move forward, but they decided to continue working in a way that had always worked for them. And then in the long run, while they're still to some degree operating in business, they lost that competitive advantage. I love this Paul Rand quote, he who stops being better stops being good. And this is, I think, I always think about this when, when I'm talking to myself about you know, how to get motivated to push through and to continue going on. It's this idea of always trying to keep up, always trying to be a change champion. Clients, colleagues, bosses, they all have to take the reins. They all have to be on board because making change in an organization is a lot like turning a giant ship. This is the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. There are over 4,500 4, people on board. It's four football fields long and it has two nuclear reactors. This thing is a beast. And a lot of times, while I was working on Project Condor, I felt like this is what we were trying to do. We were trying to change an organization, not just implement a new design. Change is really hard. I'm not up here to tell you today that this is, this is going to be easy. I'm here to try to give you the tools that have worked for me and the tips and tricks for you to go out and feel inspired to make a little bit of change one tip at a time. The first thing I feel very strongly about is building a community of supporters. It takes a village to build a responsive design system. And I say this mostly because I've had so many people come to me and say, can't you just, can't you just make our site responsive like right now? <laughs> and I mean, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of folks to do that. So when I started on Project Condor, I was shocked to learn that this was the size of my team. I had done lots of projects before that created large-scale responsive websites, but my teams were three and four the si times the size of this. And this was all engineers and one product manager. So one designer, these engineers, one product manager, we knew that we had to bring the entire company on board to be our evangelist in order to make this really work. So these guys are the best I've ever worked with. They're amazing. But the key component to even getting past the first rounds of approval were relating with the entire company. And so this is Arnaud here. Arnaud was actually the eng manager, and he had this fantastic idea. Every morning at 9 a.m., we met for breakfast, like clockwork, in the lobby of the headquarters. We all got together and we did this. Not only did this bring us closer as a team to working together, it began to create a bit of a spectacle. As folks came in in the morning and we were already there eating, they began to ask questions like, who are these folks? Why are they here eating this morning? What are you working on? Can we see what you're doing? And this invited folks to begin to learn about what we were doing and become curious. And before long, people began like hanging out with us. The teams we needed to get on board wanted to actually go with us to like ball games and hang out. And it became personal and professional. And I think that's a really key piece of trying to infiltrate change within an organization. It can't just be about the bottom line. It has to be about the entire picture. It has to be about actually wanting to spend time and making friends with the folks around you. I like to show this recent redesign as an example, I was really curious to find out how many people did this? You know, was it like five designers, six engineers? When an organization like CNN does a responsive redesign, which was mostly just responsive, making their site mobile friendly, it, 
they needed 15 visual designers, 15 art directors, UX designers, and then hundreds of people within the organization to be part of this project. When I asked them how many designers worked on the project, they couldn't tell me because they felt like everyone who worked on the project was in some ways a designer. And it's about bringing everyone in to contribute in a way that's meaningful. As I said before, it's not networking. It's about making friends with common interest. So I actually want to engage everyone in a quick experiment. I would like you to turn to the person to your right and tell them a story about your name. You know, whether or not you like your name, whether or not how you got your name, who has named that before. We're going to only take about four minutes. I'm timing you guys. But the idea here is that right now in being here at this conference, you are creating your network. So go. All right, you guys ready to come back? They're not going to be, are they? All right, thank you. You guys ready? Can I get you guys? I love that, I love that you guys took to that so, so fast. How about over here? Are you guys ready? This is fantastic. I mean, this is, you're here at the first session, you're beginning to expand your network already. And what I love about this is that you may have known the person next to you, but this has maybe opened up a whole new conversation for you. And it's about trying to find new and exciting ways to connect with the folks around you in order to bring them into your community, to bring them into 
your network in order to leverage each other's specializations to create change around you. I actually, I had done this at a presentation before and I was incredibly inspired by the fact that I recently listened to a podcast and it turned out a friend of mine who ran a podcast had met someone with a really interesting name next to them at the conference and decided they wanted to have an entire podcast episode about it. And like, you never know. You never know who's going to be sitting next to you. You never know what kinds of specializations they may be able to bring to you and your project, whether it's here at a conference and the network that you create beyond your your day-to-day -day work or your day-to-day -day work. A lot of times I, I think to myself how how lucky I am to work with the folks around me, but I forget sometimes, you know, you get used to them. You get used to the same old day in, day out, same things. So find ways to try and connect with them in a new way because mobilizing them to be part of your change is going to be the key to its success. The next set of ideas behind making change is this, this is my pyramid. And this is kind of how I see making change, making design, because anytime I'm doing a design, whether it's for a client or within an internal organization that I'm working with, I find that there's different steps to making things happen. And a lot of it is about approaching the way I do design differently every time. And so I do this by having a framework first, tactics second, and tools third. And I have it in this tiered manner because the framework is probably the most rigid part of the entire project. It's the most precise part. I break down these problem solving, um, I break down the problem solving into smaller manageable phases. And I do this in a way that makes sense to me, but it could make sense to you in any way, but this is how I, I do it. I break it down into discovery, analysis, execution, measurement, and iteration. This is just a pattern that I found works for me over a period of time. But the thing is, is when you're trying to make change, you have to be able to pivot and be flexible and roll with it. And so you may not necessarily do things in this manner every single time. This just provides pivot points so that if you want to try a few things and then find out you need to start over, you can. And the tactics, the second part of the pyramid, are the different types of things that you do within that in order to keep it fresh and try new things. Because every single context, every single problem that you're trying to solve is different. I say this mostly because folks come to me all the time and they say, hey, Samantha, I'm not sure if I'm using style tiles correctly. And I think to myself, well, it's, it's a tool, right? Like, is there one correct way to use a fork or a hammer? You know, there's lots of different ways to use these things. There's the way I do it, but I actually change this stuff up every time I approach a new problem. And so I think about turning these methods, these tools and these, these tactics that people provide me, I think about turning them on their head. So I have these things that I plug into this framework at different phases, but I try and make sure that I'm thinking about them differently depending on the context of the people I'm working with, the resources I have, the time, the amount of budget. I mean, all of these things are variable. So why isn't my process? In order to make change, you have to be really flexible. So here are some of the ideas, here are some of the things that I use that work for me, and I invite you to try them in the way that I use them, and maybe I'd love to see how you guys use them in other methods too. The first thing is surveys. I find that designers in general tend to kick things off by immediately coming up with ideas. I've been there. Matter of fact, I was really burnt. One time when I was working at an agency, I was super stoked to get this new project and I wanted to show everybody there that I could defend my design thinking. And so I came in and I presented this idea and I was gonna, th I had totally thought the client and the people inside the organization were gonna be stoked on it. And it, the first thing out of the creative director's mouth was, I can't believe you didn't ask anyone else here what it's like to work with this client. I had completely missed the boat 
I didn't realize that all of these people had been working on this project for years before I came in. And they actually had these great gold nuggets of information about their preferences, about the way they worked, about the types of things that had worked before. And it's not about necessarily using those gold nuggets, but it's about being aware and, and really finding the things, finding out, surveying the landscape, really. You know, if you think about it, anytime someone goes in and tries something new, you have to get a sense of what the landscape is before you just charge right in. So surveys is the way that I do this, and I tend to try and limit my surveys to being really short. And before I start any project, I find out who's involved, and I send them a five-question survey. And I just say, hey, give me five minutes. And this works really well inside of a large organization. Uh, it seems like a really simple like, idea, but over and over, it's easy to kind of lose these things over time. And it's easy to forget that the folks around you may have the answers that you're looking for. The next tool is something called a story map. And it was actually something that was brought to me by one of my former coworkers, James Buckhouse. James is a really interesting character. He used to actually work in animation. He worked on Shrek and Madagascar. And as him and I worked together in a tech company, he had told me about how they used to create storyboards anytime they began a new project. Really, anytime they were trying to communicate something to each other. They would sit down and they would visualize what those things would look like. So he sat down one day and thought to himself, how would this apply to the web? What would it look like if we were talking about screens on an iPhone or screens on an iPad? What, what would that translate to if this was a desktop scenario of a site? And so he actually created this thing called a story map. He's got a great explanation of it on Medium. If you just Google Medium story map, it comes up. And it's this idea of just mapping out all the different parts of a process. Not just the digital parts, though, but the human interaction parts. As you can see here, it's not just what a screen would look like, it's where's the person coming from when they're going to approach that screen in the context of how they may use it. This, for example, is a project he worked on called the Twitter Mirror. He had created an app so that when celebrities came off the red carpet at a fashion, at a fashion show, they could literally just go up to an iPad and touch it, and it would take a photo of them and tweet it for them. There was very low barrier to entry to sharing their experience there. And he had created this whole idea through a story map. I don't work on projects like the Twitter mirror, but I thought what he did was really cool. So I started to think about how this might work in the context of a website that I was creating. So I created this thing I called the Wireflow map. And frankly, it could already exist. This could be something that people use already. I don't know. But what I did was I thought about the concepts that James used to create his story maps I began to apply them to the problem at hand for my particular client. And so as you can see here, this looks very similar to what a normal wireframe would look like. But what we needed was something a little bit more expansive. We needed to be able to see all of the wireframes all at one time. And we needed to understand how users were actually getting to each part of those wireframes. So it's like a user flow, wireframe, sitemap, all at the same time. And the key to this being successful in the context that I used it in was I actually printed it out, which seems kind of crazy to people in the digital world. But when we're working together as a team, we need to be able to approach this quickly and dig in. So I print it out on a huge plotter, put it on a board, and I actually physically take it with me to every meeting. And it allows us to be able to have an open dialogue quickly so that everyone involved in the process can begin to post it note or draw or just be able to understand, oh, you're talking about that button or you're talking about that part of the process. This in itself helps to foster communication. It brings people in. And when people are feeling like they're part of the process, change happens more quickly. And so then there's style tiles. How many of you all are familiar with style tiles? So about half of you. So like style tiles, um, this is a method I began to use a few years ago when I was working in agencies. I was having a lot of trouble with burning through budgets pretty quickly because my clients expected three separate 
designs every time they contracted a project with us. And so rather than creating three actual visual mock-ups, I began to give them little samples. Like if you think of it in terms of architectural design or interior design, I was giving them carpet samples and, and swatches of paint chips early on in the process so that we wouldn't have issues further down the process. And so with style tiles, there's a very standard methodology of doing this that works with agencies, but I was actually working on a project recently where we needed to be able to, to get through a proof of concept earlier on. So this is a project I've been working on for the past nine months where we're kind of creating a way for teachers to hold classes online. We, want, we wanted to be able to have something um, similar to Google Hangouts, but Google Hangouts, for example, didn't have very specific requests that the teachers had as far as being able to break people into groups, being able to live edit things while still being on video. So we didn't know if this was something people wanted. We didn't know if this was something that would work. So rather than creating a wireframe, because a wireframe was really too low of the fidelity that we needed in order to test it, we went through and created Photoshop mocks for all of this, the pages that proved whether or not this was a concept worth investing in. So once we got the buy-in and we shopped it around, found out people were into it, and in this situation we got investment, we decided that we needed to rethink the way it looked. Now the folks involved actually really liked the way it looked, but they had been using these words throughout the process, like open and friendly, that I felt like just were not exhibited in this first look and feel. So rather than doing the traditional style tile method, I just gave them two other quick examples of how we could pair the visuals with particular UI elements. And this is what we ended up with in the end. It's not a matter of using style tiles, it's a matter of taking a tool that exists, something that has proven track record for success, and applying it conceptually in a different way to the problems at hand. Prototypes. So that was a situation where we didn't need prototypes, but I have found that particularly in a large organization, a prototype can save you from a thousand meetings. And this is something I struggle with because a lot of folks believe, for example, that designers should code, or maybe everyone should code. And I think that's awesome. I think that's great. I think if everyone could know how to code, that'd be great. But the reality of the situation is, is when I'm in a meeting and I have a team, I can't wait for them to get up to speed on coding for me to be able to create something and get approval on it. So there needs to be faster ways to get to a prototype. And so some of the methods I've used, for example, are macaw. People call macaw a Photoshop killer. I don't think it is at all. I, I use it actually for prototyping. And so what I've found is, is I can drag my images into Macaw pretty quickly, and it has a feature here in the upper right-hand corner where you can indicate different screen sizes. And what it does is it will actually shrink your screen size and show you what it would look like. Those images were on the page that way, and then you can adjust those images to react. And it's pretty quick. It only took me about 15 minutes to do this right here. And so if you kind of see here, I have a, a little demo. That's the right-hand corner where you can toggle the different sizes. And what this does is this is a very fast way to explain what responsive looks like to someone who may not understand the concept. So 15 minutes, there's a little bit of overhead here, but showing is so much better than telling in some circumstances. And if you have the hurdle of not necessarily being able to prototype something in code, there are other ways to do it. Another example is just Keynote. And I'm, I'm really big on the animation properties in Keynote. You can quickly show something as simple, for example, as a, a regular web page, but if you, instead of just showing it as a mock-up that's static in the browser, just presenting it like this, the way you would scroll on the page, it all of a sudden comes to life. You start to understand. Someone who may not have the capacity to be able to make the judgment from what a static mock-up looks like to what an actual web page looks like can begin to relate a little better. And it's all about the presentation, right? What's great about Keynote is, is that it actually allows you to show something with a group of people. It's about not necessarily just 
throwing a link over the, the wall and expecting some feedback. It's about getting people involved, and Keynote allows you to be able to show a presentation, but while you're presenting your ideas, having the language there to actually resonate with your stakeholders is key. So I talked earlier a little bit about the, the failures that I had with resonating with the stakeholders with Project Condor, but what I found is instead of saying, hey, this design makes this page look really symmetrical and that will be more inviting for users, adapting the way I talk about the design, depending on who is interested, can make a major difference in creating change within the organization. So these are some of the top, top um, goals for a lot of companies. You know, saving money, for example. But when I was working in an agency, it wasn't necessarily about making more money. It was about how do we save money within the budget that we have so that we actually have money left over. So presenting an idea in a context that allows people to understand that can be very, very powerful. Process change can oftentimes mean you know, saving time, saving money. An example of this was when I was working on a, um, a hotel site a few years ago. They were actually an economy hotel chain here in the United States, but in Scandinavia, they were very upscale. And rather than doing a full redesign for them, we just changed their colors and some very simple font changes. And this small iterative change boosted their sales over three, three months to 33%. And with that small iteration, I could hook in. I began to observe how they reacted to that change. I love this quote. A writer is someone who pays attention to the world, but I think that it needs a change for what we're talking about here, which is a designer is someone who pays attention to the world. So your job as a designer not only is to design and make change, but to also pay attention to what matters to those around you in order to make the change. Observe what matters, then reframe your design change around that, depending on who your audience is. Just like you wouldn't necessarily design, make the same design for every single user, we're talking about empathizing with those around us who may be resistant to change in order to frame the context of your design to make the change that matters to them. And then lastly, before I wrap up, I just want to talk about sharing and how important I think that is. Not only for the success of design within your company or within your organization, but just as a community here together, the importance of sharing. I feel very strongly that a designer who is making change is actually giving it 151%. It's a matter of doing your job and then also doing the 51% of getting out there, pushing change, and also sharing that change. And this is an example of a content strategist I worked with at, my previous, uh, at the previous tech company, and she was super stealth. She didn't go out there, she didn't go get up on stages and, and tell, tell people about what she was doing. She had a secret power. She'd also kill me if she knew I was showing you this right now. She was actually in the Olympics, the, Australia, the Olympics that was in Sydney, Australia. She was a synchronized swimmer. You can see her there in the bottom right. Few people would know that. She's much more comfortable in the pool and doing physical activity than she is maybe uh, pitching someone on an idea directly. And so what she's done is, is she's actually managed to curb that power to be very stealth in the change that she makes within the organization. I talked about you know, having breakfast in the morning and inviting folks to kind of know what you're doing. And it's a matter of taking whatever your strength is and finding how to connect with people in order to begin to, to convince them that the change is important. So this is Bridget here, and the CEO of the company is actually two to her left, um, or two to, two to your left, um, three to your left, and um, she ran like a triathlon with them. Um, this put her in a very, this is a very small group of change makers within the organization that she's infiltrated because she took what she loved and she made it public within the company. And it doesn't have to be something like running a triathlon, right? It could be organizing a debate club. It could be creating an after work knitting group. Whatever it is that you're passionate about, finding ways to connect people, and then having that personal connection that you build trust with them. 
So that's, that's a way to, to build trust internally and share internally. But I mean, as you're working, there's tons of ways of doing this. No matter what it is you as an organization use to share documents, if you just share along the way, that can build trust immensely. So whether it's Slack or uh, if you use Basecamp, just constantly giving people updates. And it doesn't have to be formal. I'm not saying like, hey, give like a formal report on what you're doing, but like, hey, here's a really pic cute picture of a cat, you know, bouncing off a wall. And by the way, I also made this change to our responsive system today. You guys want to take a, take a look at it. I used to work with this gentleman named Dave. He's a UX designer. And he used to tell me something that's always stuck with me. It doesn't exist if it's not in the wiki. So we had an, organ we had an organizational wiki, right? And it's just where everybody kind of goes to see where we are as a company as far as documentation. And I'd tell him, hey, we did this, we did that. He'd be like, it's not in the wiki, no one else here knows. And that left a really important impression on me of just this getting in the habit of documenting and, and keeping it somewhere that's visible. And hey, people may not check it out, but if you get in the habit of saying, hey, it's there, hey, it's there, hey, it's there, People, people will begin to adapt and start to check those things out. And the last one is you know, sharing things publicly. And this can also have a very powerful effect even internally when especially someone within your organization finds out that you shared something publicly and it resonated publicly. And it doesn't have to be, again, getting on stage at a conference and talking. It doesn't have to be something that's in the limelight. This is Doug Avery. And Doug, I worked with Doug a few years ago in an agency, and um, he is deathly shy. Like, would ne barely can look you in the eye, but he's brilliant and he's amazing. And he actually decided to redesign our blog one day. And if you're familiar with this, a few years ago, it was on all the CSS, Zen Gardens and stuff. He came to the agency not knowing any code. He was completely a print designer, and he spent three weeks learned code, learned how to do interactive design, created a site that not only was beautiful, but was picked up around the world for being a great example of digital design. And what he started to do was, he started to document exactly how he did that. He made a change in his own life by learning code, but also by doing something different. And he began to blog. And like six years later, he constantly blogs. He doesn't do anything but blog to share his information. And people have caught on, they get really excited and they listen. He's now the director of front end design for that agency. He made a change in his own life. He went from being a print designer to being the director of front end de design. So to wrap things up, change is really hard. I'm not, I'm not at all telling you guys that like, oh hey, it's easy peasy, go do it tomorrow. No, it's something you gotta work at. It's something that we all have to work at, no matter what organization you're with, no matter who it is or, or what it is you're trying to do. And if you fail, you just try over again. Nobody gets it right the first time. As I showed you earlier, I've had lots of failures, and everyone has lots of failures, whether they expose them to the world or not. It's all about doing things and learning from them. I love this quote from Paula Scher. It's through mistakes that you actually grow. You have to get bad in order to get good. I'm not endorsing that whole fail fast, fail often. No, I mean, don't intentionally fail, but try new things, take new risks, and subtly try to make change within your organization. Again, change is hard, but try new things. If they work for you, please share them, because I want to know what they are so I can try them for myself. Thank you so much. And so we're going to wrap up. We're at 10.30 right now.